Thank you very much for coming out. Uh, it's, it's been a distinct pleasure of mine to be, to be asked to come here and talk about something that we've become passionate about over the last several years. Um, I had a wonderful day uh, speaking to some students, meeting some faculty members. This is a beautiful campus. Uh, I live right down the street. Uh, I'm ashamed to say I've never been here before, so hopefully this isn't my last time. So today, again, reinvent the toilet. Uh, how many people have a toilet in their house? How many people think it needs to be reinvented? Some people say, say yes. I didn't think so five years ago. I thought of when I flushed it, things just went away. So real quick, I want to touch on what RTI is and what we do at RTI. So RTI, Research Triangle Institute, we're right down the street. We're centered in RTP. We're the second largest not-for-profit research institute in the country. Um, our goal is to improve the human condition. Um, we have multidisciplinary expertises that allow us to attack problems at different angles, whether it's engineering, social science, uh, international governance. So if you look at RTI in, in terms of staff, we're close to 5,000 people. Uh, we have a worldwide footprint, which makes us uh, quite diverse and able to uh, utilize our expertise in, in underdeveloped worlds. Our, uh, we have 80 offices throughout the, throughout the world. We're heavy in Southeast Asia and Africa. Uh, we do a lot of uh, different types of research. So if you look at some of the things that we're involved in, uh, we do a lot of things within the health, education, uh, international development, energy research, uh, environmental sciences, social and justice policy, uh, innovation, food security, food and ag. So we do quite a bit of things under one umbrella. Some of the services and capabilities that we look at, we have, uh, we can deliver independent object, uh, objective and scientifically rigorous research development. And by doing so, we, we do a lot of survey and data collections. We do statistical analysis and data science evaluation, assessment, and analysis, drug discovery, program design, analytical laboratories that help us do that, and of course, engineering, technology, R&D, and that's the group that I represent here this evening. Also, what do we do? We like to attack the emerging issues that are currently out there today. Uh, some of the things that we look at, global health security, uh, policing research, marijuana research, e-cigarette research, uh, more recently, the Zika virus, uh, opiate research, uh, global and non-communicable diseases, data for development, and some drone research. And one thing that you don't have up there currently is WASH. Um, how many people know what WASH stands for? Not a lot of people. So it stands for water, sanitation, and hygiene. Um, and, and I was describing earlier today, if you think of it as a Venn diagram, um, they're all interconnected very intimately, but they're also independent. And what we want to discuss here tonight is, is how sanitation plays a big role in this. So this is a great intro video that we saw about five years ago. It was published by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and it helped spawn some of the passions that you're going to hear about this evening. But I thought I would allow this Doo -doo. to play. Number two, caca, crap, Shit. There's a ton of it and dozens of words to describe it, but for 2.6 billion people around the globe, there's no place to actually do it. Imagine that, no reliable sanitary toilet. What would you do? Well, what you have to do, use anything you can find, which means in no time, you've got a big pile of problems, like diseases, deadly diseases that are filling half the hospital beds in developing countries, a serious, well, crappy scenario that by working in partnership, we can change. How? By doing something that hasn't been done for centuries, reinventing the toilet. The flush toilet, as you and I know it, requires a massive amount of sewer infrastructure and immense amounts of water, two things increasingly hard to come by. Now is the time to eliminate the health hazards, recycle waste, and turn crap into valuable resources like clean burning fuel, fertilizer, and believe it or not, fresh water. Today, our toilets can't do that, but the toilet of tomorrow can. Reinventing the toilet. Let's get our shit together and do it. 
So I think that was a better way of describing the problem. Um, I apologize for the young people in the crowd, uh, but we bleeped out the good words. So if we look at sanitation uh, in terms of a global issue, it, it's becoming a, a widespread crisis. Um, the last report by the WHO uh, said that 2.6 billion people practice open defecation and lack adequate sanitation facilities. Uh, that's an enormous population throughout the world. More people die from poor sanitation than measles, malaria, and HIV AIDS put together. Um, that tells me that it's, it, it's an epidemic. And then an additional 2.1 billion people live in our, our urban residents and use facilities that do not safely dispose of human waste. Uh, you see a couple pictures here on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, that's real-world pictures that were taken by the team. Um, that is a toilet up here on this pedestal. This is where they're using the restroom. If we can get the... Um, and then this is below is, a, is basically a fecal stream. This is where people um, have pipes of sewage, raw sewage, dumping into their water source. So people have quantified this issue. And again, uh, the World Health Organization likes to do it. Um, so if you look at the globe as, as a whole, 7.5 billion people are in the world today. Okay, 54% of the world's population live in cities, they're urban. Now, one billion of that seven and a half mil a billion live in slum areas. These are the folks that are underserved and have zero access to sanitation. And then if you look at 27% of the world's population have no access to sewers. I mean, this is an enormous amount of people with a large problem. So if you can break it down even further, you have 19% of unlimited services. That's folks like us. You know, when we flush the toilet, it goes away. We don't see it again unless we've done something poor. Um, but it goes off and it gets treated. 14% uh, have limited services. 47% of the world's population have basic services to sanitation. And then 20% are open defecation. I mean, that's incredible if you think about it. So, if we look at this cartoon, and this cartoon was developed by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation several years ago, and we can look at it as a service chain. So you have containment, emptying, transport, treatment, and then any type of reuse that you can along the chain. So you have point of source to, to transport, to remediation of some sort, and then what can we do with it after the fact? So how do we create value at each stage of the game? You know, is there value of the, at each stage? We think there is. The foundation thinks there is. There's a lot of people putting a lot of money in behind this that think, it, think there is. So first step I want to look at before we go back to the toilet is look at emptying and transport. So how do we extract it? How do we transport it? So one of the programs that we've been developing over the last few years is looking at transport. We were tasked by the foundation to take a look at how we can actually take a pit emptying solution and transport it efficiently and uh, cost effectively to a point of, of a, a source of remediation or a source of treatment. So what we looked at doing is possibly designing a, a, a truck, a pit emptying truck that can actually suck in any type of sludge. It would dewater it on site and then take the remainder and then take it off to the treatment facility. But then again, we want to be able to treat that water, that extra liquid that comes out of that fecal stream. So how can we do that? So we think we can implement some type of technology on the side of that vehicle uh, that could use either a forward osmosis or a reverse osmosis treatment, and you can actually get non-potable water, and then people could use that for agricultural needs. One interesting aspect of, of pit emptying is that if you have a 99% liquid fecal stream and it's 1% solid, okay, so it's, it's heavily in liquid, if you dewater it 10%, you can save 80% volume on that truck. So if you have a truck that contains 10 cubic meters of, of solid waste, if you can dewater it at the point of emptying, now you're not emptying just one pit, you're gonna be able, be able to empty eight to 10 pits. That saves an enormous amount of money, and it also spawns some entrepreneurship and then be and, and able to uh, solve some issues on extraction and, and uh, 
and transport. So the next step is processing. How do you take this stream, this fecal stream, this waste stream in, and how do you treat it? How do you do it on site, or how do you do it at the, at the containment center or wherever that you need to do it? So what we've looked at is we've developed a program outside of the, the division I'm in, uh, and what they're looking at is taking a fecal stream in. They have some biofuels technology built behind it. It's a catalytic process, but what it does is it takes the, the waste, it brings it in, and it actually makes a diesel fuel out of it. So it makes a bio oil out of, the, out of the feces. It can be hydrogenated further into a diesel fuel, which is incredible. Another side is aqueous solution that's heavy in nitrogen because of the urea in the stream itself. That can be extracted out, and now all of a sudden you have nitrogen, you have a fertilizer. So we like to think of this sanitation chain as actually a value chain worth the commodities. The one thing that's going to happen is that the world's going to keep growing, and the waste stream is going to keep getting worse. And so let's take a look at it in a way that we haven't done in the past, and let's make something out of it, make something good out of it. So now to the point of the conversation, where the, where, you know, where the rubber meets the road, where the good stuff is, is reinvent the toilet. Um, and now this is what we're going to look at is that point of source uh, remediation, where we want to treat it on site, get done with it at the toilet facility itself. So before we even get any further, let's take a look at the invention of the toilet, um, which I think is a, a clever slide, because contrary to belief, everybody thought Thomas Crapper invented the toilet. Well, he didn't. He actually was in the forefront, and he held nine patents on the flush toilet. What's interesting is that John Harrington in 1596, I believe it was, actually invented the flush toilet. So it's been around for quite some time. And then again, Alexander Cummings came in in 1775 and developed the S-trap. And the S-trap is fantastic because it reduces the odor. So as you go to the restroom, you don't have it come back up through that S-trap. So this was a neat little slide that a colleague of mine did not too long ago that I didn't, I didn't realize who invented the toilet. but but it's kind of neat, because I thought Thomas Crapper did. So we're going to look at a short video of our approach, and then I'm going to go through it here in a minute. But this is the technology on, on what we decided to do, and we, we're looking at several different systems. We wanted to integrate them in a modular fashion, but we wanted to treat the waste on site. So this gives you a nice little overview of what we're doing today, currently, and then we're going to back step a little bit and take a look at some technologies we evaluated and then why it's important to engage into a, into a community itself. See how do I get this going? So again, I'll walk you through this here in a second, but this gives you an idea of how we take a flush, how we separate solid from liquids. This is the processing of the solids. Uh, we use a, a mixing technique, a homogenizer, so we get a consistent material that we dispense onto a drying plate. This drying plate is using a heat from a biomass combustor. The dry fuel then drops into that combustor. Um, we try to harness that thermal energy and convert it into electrical energy. Uh, that's what sustains the, the facility itself, powers it. The liquid waste. Um, it's filtered down into a modified uh, baffle system. This baffle system actually takes a lot of the uh, extra solids out. It's then treated using a uh, off-the-shelf electrochemical cell, a mixed metal oxide cell. And then we take the treated effluent, which has been treated to sterilization, and we actually reuse it, re reuse it for flush. So that's just kind of a neat way to kind of visualize exactly what we're doing. So if we look at the cartoon model a little bit, it might be easier to to take a look at. So the top part where you have the separate urine from the feces, so it's a, it's a, uh, a, a series of, of polymer belts. These polymer belts, the flush comes down on top of it. The solid is harnessed there. We manage it over uh, into an accumulator macerator where then again we dry and burn the feces. Uh, what's amazing is, is for centuries people have been burning dung to cook food on, in, uh, on cook stoves. And, Human feces burns extremely hot. Um, it's very comparable to wood in terms of caloric value. 
Uh, and it, uh, it's, I was quite amazed when we did our first, first test. And then again, the, uh, the liquid system, uh, has anybody been in a saltwater pool before? This is a very similar type of technology. What we like to look at is uh, we're using an electrochemical process. And within the urine and within that liquid waste, it's heavy laden with salts. We utilize those salts. We put it through an electrochemical process. We cleave it. We produce chlorine. Chlorine is one of the best disinfections out there, disinfectants. So we use that to sterilize and disinfect that effluent. So taking that, you know, moving from lab to a field deployable technology has been an extreme challenge for us. Um, it, we're about four to five years deep into the program. Uh, we've been testing for quite some time. Uh, we found it very important to test offshore. Uh, we have some partners in India that help us do that. But not only do we have a working facility in our, in our current labs at RTI at Duke, but we also have a, a testing facility in Ahmedabad, India. So some of the metrics that I want to walk you through from the first evolution of the technology to, to what we're testing today is, is we wanted to do a lot of user studies. We wanted to understand the social aspects. Uh, how do we get the community engaged? How do we understand exactly what type of technology they'll adopt? Uh, we need to have process controls. We needed to make sure we understood how the processes work together. We needed to understand the waste. The waste is completely different from here to India. Um, we wanted to look at combustion. Uh, we wanted to understand the input in the fuel analysis. Uh, a vegetarian diet is extremely different from a, a meat eater's diet. Um, the liquid waste, we needed to understand the discharge and reuse standards for that local area and what it meant if we needed to discharge in the environment. And then, of course, energy consumption. You know, our metric was to be energy neutral, but we understand that if we have some power, we'll be able to run this system. Um, but we wanted to understand exactly what we needed to do in order to solve some issues that we had. And then again, cost. Um, that's going to be a huge driver in anybody accepting anything. Uh, it can't be expensive. Um, it's got to be easy to maintain. And it's got to be uh, 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 last a long time. So this was our alpha portion. Um, we failed dramatically. We failed elegantly. Uh, but we learned a lot of lessons from what we were doing. Uh, so the next rev was beta, and we utilized, again, uh, in the lab, going to the field, we learned a lot. Uh, we upped our usage. We went to daily processing, and we wanted to treat all the waste that came in. Uh, we developed some fully automated controls, so we are allowed to be a little bit more autonomous than before, so we could take a step back, let the users interact with the technology, let the technology do its job, and then we would intervene when necessary. Uh, again, look at combustion. We needed to integrate a combustion uh, as a subsystem as a whole. So now we're working with a complete system. The liquid, we wanted to leverage some technologies to understand for reuse applications. Uh, we struggled quite a bit, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, with color and turbidity. Uh, nobody wants to go to the restroom when they look down in a bowl and it's brown water and it doesn't smell good. I mean, I think that's, everybody would be, be be, uh, would agree with that. Uh, we needed to improve the energy efficiency. Uh, and then again, we wanted to stress test more. Uh, when you develop a product, you want to be able to put it through its paces. You want to understand where it fails so you can make it better. And then again, uh, more recently, we're deploying more field testing units to where we can actually understand another demographic. Um, we're deploying one in Coimbatore, India, at, uh, at a facility that, that uh, is, is all women at a women's dorm. Uh, and then again, we're going to the slums of Durban. So broken down in the systems, we have a liquid system, and then we have a solid system. And this is, yeah, we can read that pretty good. This is the evolution of what we looked at and how we derived to where we are today. Um, we started out with an idea. That idea was to do an electrochemical process, and let's treat some waste. So we looked at a surrogate. We looked at urine that was spiked with E. coli. That tended to be real easy. Um, we felt fairly confident going into the next rev, um, the next type of steps of testing, that we would be extremely uh, successful. Well, that wasn't the case. Uh, as soon as we added um, poop to the equation, uh, we got a rude awakening. And uh, what that was was a litany of issues that we really had to track down. And disinfection became much harder. Um, 
but we learned a lot. The next step was actually uh, to take this system, make it more automated. We wanted to make sure that our output was sterilized. We wanted to make sure people were safe. Um, and then what we've done now is we've, we've uh, actually increased the usage of the electrochemical cell to make sure that we're hitting it with a hammer. Uh, and again, we're going to talk about some hybrid approaches that we did to kind of think things through and make things a little bit better. So as I mentioned, um, model wastewater was, was easy to disinfect. And what this represents here is, is um, the kill ratio, the log of the kill ratio as it, as it relates to the energy per liter to disinfect. And the yellow dots represent our model wastewater. And it was very easy to disinfect and had very low energy. So we felt really confident that, that this was a viable solution. But as soon as we went to fecal contaminated, man, it significantly increased the energy to require for disinfection. And that's where you see the, the orange dots here. Um, we also wanted to engage in, uh, in recycling. We, we thought that that was going to be extremely important in, in water-starved areas. Uh, and how we were doing that is we wanted to basically take that effluent, which didn't look good at the time, but we wanted to recycle it for flush. And then what we saw here was days from startup and the percent solids within that, um, within that fecal stream. And what's interesting was that we saw the system reach a steady state. So we got to a point where, where we had a, a, a saturation of solid content in that stream. Uh, the processing needed to be optimized because uh, what we were looking at was um, an extremely large amount of energy to disinfect. Um, the graph over here on the right-hand side shows the uh, electrochemical uh, or the MPN, the number of uh, um, kill units for the uh, energy needed. And what was interesting is that we saw this long tail. Um, we were able to disinfect really rapidly at the beginning, and then we had a long tail that was taking a lot of energy to disinfect. That was very confusing at the time and trying to figure it out. So some of the things we wanted to look at was the conductivity. We needed to make sure the conductivity was the appropriate way that we were using the electrochemical process to actually remediate all the bacteria in it. So what this data basically states is that over a number of user days and the type of settling system we were using, we were getting too much solid material through, so, uh, which, which increased the conductivity. So what we decided to do is look at the baffle tank design itself. Like how can we bring more solids out of it? So we did do a new baffle design and we did see a nice increase in user days, but what we did see is that we still needed some more work to do in order to remediate the bacteria out of this. Again, data, I love data. So conductivity, COD, and disinfection energy. So what this is representing here is the conductivity, again, just another way of plotting it and then looking at the energy per kill. Uh, so the disinfection energy demand increases with the conductivity regardless of the baffle design. Um, we thought we were hitting a home run on this, but then again, we had to take a step back and take a look at what was going on. So what we saw was that the reduction of the suspended solids doesn't significantly lower the energy demand, but it did indicate that the reduction should be more focused on the chemical oxygen demand. So we felt that these solid particles were actually harnessing the bacteria, and they were basically a protective shell. Um, we could hit it with a hammer as long as we wanted to, but that was energy intensive, and that wasn't going to be a solution that was going to help us. So this led us to some lessons learned from the lab um, and then also the field where we're testing. So if we look at this um, jar on the right-hand side here, it's, it, that is what our effluent looks like after it's treated. That's what we were recycling. That's what we were showing to the users at the time, and we got some very negative feedback. So, but we looked at it. We're killing it. We're killing everything in it, but it took a massive amount of energy to do this. So. What the field studies indicate were just merely that we, we, we were insufficient. Um, we had to improve the color, the odor, and the turbidity in order to be successful on this. So some of the things we did is we just upped the energy. We say, OK, we're going to polish this liquid as long as we can. We were able to do so, uh, the electrochemical process, but we didn't feel that this was a solution that was going to be viable uh, for what we wanted to look at. So from there, 
we decided to take a more hybrid approach. And the hybrid approach is, is let's take a look at things that are developed for other purposes, um, for other industries, uh, anywhere we can pick a technology from and try to integrate it with this solution. And what we looked at was granulated activated carbon. If anybody has a Brita water filter in their fridge, I don't know if anybody has that anymore, but it's the same thing. It's the exact same thing. So what you see here is just a lab developed system. Uh, the long cylinder here and the dark material is the activated carbon. We would run our effluent, trickle it through this thing. And what we saw was that not only did we have a massive reduction in color, but we also had a massive reduction in COD. That's gonna help us. That's gonna help us figure out where we wanna go and how we wanna treat. So this was an interesting way of, of, of plotting the numbers uh, and looking at exactly what we're doing. So the first column looks at in, um, the automation of a specific year. We're looking at the energy that it takes to kill during electrochemical process. The COD, turbidity, and color numbers, quite high, would not pass any type of discharge standards. Uh, we looked at the settling tank re redesign. So we're pulling out some solid, solid material before treatment. What we saw was a little bit of reduction in every, almost everything, uh, a significant reduction in turbidity. So that was gonna help out quite a bit. But when we implemented a hybrid solution before we did the treatment, before we looked at, before we decided to do the electrochemical process, we wanted to pull out anything we could beforehand. What we see is almost a half, 50% reduction from the original approach in energy. That's a big check mark. Um, the COD was dramatically reduced, so we're getting there. The turbidity was getting close to where it was clear, so we're getting excited about that. And then these are the colors of the, of the affluent that you see at the very bottom. And then again, the color, still a little bit turbid, but we're, we're living with it. So the next step was actually to put one pre and post process. And what we see here is that uh, the numbers are getting much better. Again, we don't have a lot of data to support what we're showing, but the trend is going in the correct direction. So we have a massive reduction in COD. Uh, the turbidity is close to clear. Uh, and then again, the color is also very good too. So this is, this is really exciting for us because not only are we able to potentially discharge this effluent, we're not going to hurt the environment. We're not gonna reinfect anything. Uh, and we just wanna make sure that the end user will be comfortable using the technology. So again, this gives you a little bit more detail in exactly what we're doing, a little bit better pictures, I think. Um, so we have this hybrid approach. We're utilizing the electrochemical and also the uh, granulated active carbon and enables this treatment both hygienic and user acceptable levels. What's great is that it looks, but it smells fantastic. It smells like chlorinated water. So we're very excited about that. And again, you see the reduction in energy. So before we were looking at 100 to you know, 50 to 100 kilojoules, if we wanted to polish it, which is the middle uh, vial in the center, we're polishing an electrochemical only, that took a very long time to get to it and in a massive amount of energy. But just implementing a hybrid approach that makes things a little bit easier, we've reduced that energy well under half of what we were doing before. So this was really exciting for, for the group. And again, I, I can't stress enough how important it is to test offshore or wherever you plan on implementing the technology. Um, our testing site at SEP University in Ahmedabad, this is some of the data that we have here. So we implemented both systems uh, both pre-process and post-process. And what's really nice is that we've gotten uh, very good feedback from the users in terms of what that liquid looks like when they go in and use the restroom. So just some summary from the liquid system. Steady state parameters were well-defined, the conductivity, total solids, and uh, total suspended solids. The, the disinfection energy demand increases with increased conductivity and the chemical oxygen demand. Uh, again, this is, these are just metrics that we found to be extremely important to what we are doing. As the effluent becomes more concentrated, uh, the, emergency, uh, the emergence of a long tail uh, seems to be the energy hog. So we found that this long tail was, our, was, was, was the big issue that we had. Um, and then so reducing these suspended particles improved not only the appearance 
but it does not affect the disinfection energy. But what we did find was that when we reduced the COD, we found an enormous energy savings on that. So moving forward, as we develop more technologies for this system, what we want to do is focus on not only the dissolved components within our system, but we want to start thinking more of hybrid approaches. We want to take a look at exactly what's out there. And that's been the focus of our program officer, the foundation, uh, any of the funding agencies that's been involved, is how can you find a, a, the Lego approach, a modular system that can benefit from multiple things being interacting together. So real quickly, we'll move on uh, to the solid side, the, the, the meat and potatoes of the, of the system itself. Um, so integrating this was even more of a challenge. Uh, the, the liquid was well ahead of the game. Uh, solid system, poop, um, I've said it multiple times today. Uh, I'm a material scientist. I've never read about a material like this in a book. Um, you can't dry it, it sticks. Um, it's, it's, it's an incredible uh, uh, material to work with. So if we look at the, the drying system itself and you see some CAD renderings of what exactly we're doing from the, the solid liquid separator to the, to the accumulator macerator and then the drying and combustion unit, um, we felt in order to be successful, we needed to, to automate the system. We needed to make sure that it worked efficiently and properly. Uh, the drying dynamics, we needed to understand how you can dry uh, feces. Uh, and there's multiple ways, conduction, convection. Um, there's a lot of theories behind that. And then the combustor, um, we felt that that was the heart of the system. We needed to figure out how to burn poop. Um, and that has been probably the easier of the challenge, uh, which is in incredible also. So some of the challenges that we've looked at to date was reliable ignition. How, do you, how, do you, how dry does it have to be in order you get a flame? Uh, fuel metering, how, ca how can you meter the fuel at an approximate rate to get the temperatures that you need, but also to sustain the system? Um, and then, of course, thermal losses. We have a ton of thermal losses within the system. We need to understand exactly how we're, we're capturing any thermal energy and then converting it. And then again, odor. Uh, odor will be a big issue. Uh, it stinks. Uh, I mean, poop stinks. So we have a hard time trying to figure out exactly how we can remediate odor within the system itself. So these are some great videos of the, whoop, of the process itself. So these are the testing unit in RTI. Um, this is where we do live testing with, with real materials. Uh, the first video we'll look at is actually the solid liquid separator. And what you're noticing here is a flush. And then you have the solid material that is managed over the series of belts here in a second. I was hoping to do this in 3D for you, but I didn't think that would be a good idea. So the solid material drops into the, solid, the, the accumulator macerator. <laughs> yep. So again, the accumulator macerator. So what we have here is the feces dropping into the, the accumulator very nicely. We then actuate a piston. As you saw in the video, that piston is then pressed forward up against two rotating plates that could manage any other solid material. Um, but it basically mixes the system up. Um, we have, let's see what we have here. This is. The extrusion of the material on the drying plate. Um, and we like to call the, the piece up top the snow plow, which actually pulls the dried material off. This is post dry. Uh, this is dried fuel. And we use that to drop into the combustor, and then that fuels the system. So, what we're basically demonstrating here is that this is a system, um, it's fully integrated. It actually treats everything you put in it, um, and, and it's fully controlled. Um, it's a port john on steroids. So one thing uh, that we needed to understand, and, and I've mentioned it quite a few times, is the energy, the energy it takes to run the system. And what we have here is just a simple graph where we look at um, 
On the right-hand side of the graph, electrical energy costs, uh, uh, U.S. dollars per person per day. Um, and what we're looking at is the average electrical energy cost in India at the site that we're testing today, um, which is 6.4 cents uh, per kilowatt hour. But what's nice is our original um, uh, testing prototype that we put out in the field was about 487 megajoules to run the system, to actually process material that came into that system. That was about 87 cents a day. Now, the metric we wanted to eat, uh, meet by the foundation, Bill Melinda Gates Foundation, was five cents per user per day. Uh, that's, a, that's a challenge. Um, our next system was beta. It was about 57 megajoules, so considerably a lot less energy. And that was about 11 cents a day. And if we get energy neutral, which is about 0.2 or about, uh, 2 cents per day, uh, is about seven megajoules to run the system. Uh, what's interesting is that our latest rev that we just deployed out in the field is about 26 megajoules. And something that we haven't done is implement solar. Uh, solar is one of the uh, uh, alternative uh, energy sources that the, the foundation, our program officer, did not want us to leverage. Uh, one of the reasons is theft. Um, and then, then you've rendered your facility useless. But if we can actually use uh, two 250 watt uh, solar panels were now off the grid. We actually have a system that can treat the waste and be sustainable. So some issues and future risks on, on taking this technology further is, is uh, the integration of, of a combustor into the system. Uh, whenever you implement uh, anything thermal, uh, there's a lot of safety issues that you need to be concerned about, um, especially from the end user point of view. Uh, we need to optimize how we actually feed this combustor. Uh, we need to evaluate emissions. We want to make sure that we're not emitting any VOCs or harmful uh, toxins into the atmosphere, not only for environmental, but also the health of the community. Uh, we need to evaluate and, and control any leaks that cause us to lose thermal energy. Uh, and of course, we need to insulate it better. Uh, and then we need to look at mass balance and how do we define mass balance. So how do we make sure that the system gets the fuel it needs to sustain it? Um, we're not quite sure how to attack that before we looked at it, how much fuel we burn per hour and how much fuel we were producing per hour. I think now uh, uh, there's some arguments to actually change that to look at jet drying as the heart of the system. So how can we focus our efforts on drying uh, as opposed to combustion. And, and what that means is how can we effectively and efficiently dry this material that allows us to combust and be more successful? And then again, stress test. We need to, we need to get back out in the field. We need to understand where it's going to fail, uh, develop these control parameters and failure modes. Uh, we need to stress test not only at the SEP facility, but deploy more units out in the field so we can understand where these failures are going to happen and, and how to attack them. And then again, odor and, and liquid polishing. So the highest risk is how do we dry? Uh, if anybody has any ideas, I've, I'm well, uh, uh, my ears are open, that's for sure. So I, I want to switch gears a little bit, and I want to talk a little bit, not only the technology portion of it, but I want to look at leveraging how you do soft launches, how do you get a community engaged, and how do you understand exactly what it means to, to to put a technology out there. Um, we've been fortunate to have a university partner uh, in Ahmedabad at SEP University, and we've been using this as a test site uh, where we bring in users, they use the facility, we process everything there, we allow them to see the technology, we'd like them to, to evaluate it and give us their honest opinion about it. Um, we've gained valuable knowledge, um, and we're currently testing daily there. Um, this has been a major asset in terms of developing control parameters and exactly how we process waste. Um, we test weekly to make sure that we're disinfecting and making sure that we're hitting the metrics that we say we're hitting. And then again, we also uh, want to manufacture these locally. Um, and what this allows us to do is to engage into some prototype partners and potential manufacturing partners to take a look at possibly who can carry this technology and develop it further and then deploy it. Um, we're allowed, uh, this allows us to vet these folks. Um, as they build subsystems, we put them on our facility and test them there. 
So some of the lessons learned, uh, which has been crazy, uh, uh, how we found out and, and how we react to it. Uh, the first one was a shocking hazard. We, we, we found that uh, some people were complaining that they felt an electrical shock as they walked into the building and to the facility. Well, that concerned us drastically. So we shut it down. Uh, we looked at uh, whether everything was grounded. You know, we went through the whole nine yards. Well, what we found out was that these users were barefoot and they were uh, experiencing static charges. So it really wasn't a shocking hazard. They were just, as you pull a sweater off and you get shocked, that's what was happening. But again, it, it caused for concern. Uh, the second one was uh, solid accumulation. Uh, we found that as we had an influx of, of users, we had a, uh, 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 basically, we overflowed. Um, and it made us go back and think about how we're engineering and, and how we need to size things differently and how we need to process differently. Next was the solid liquid separator. Um, and what you see here is the cartridge being pulled out. Um, we had belt failures, and we were failing um, more often than, than we should have. Um, there were a lot of ideas and theories that walked around on this. We looked at the potential of larva uh, being, being, uh, eating the polymer, the polymer belts within the system itself. But what we found was any time we had a high-level visitor come to our facility, the technicians who were supporting us at it would use a cleaning solution um, that was 14.5 weight to volume percent hydrochloric acid. When you dump that into water, you actually get a plume of chlorine gas. So the people we talked to would say, oh yeah, we use it once a month and then we leave the house for a day. Um, so this was actually degrading our belts, and it took us eight months to figure this out. So one of the uh, uh, components as an engineer uh, that I never thought about was actually engaging a community um, in, in the value of user studies. Um, some of the discussions we had today in some of the classes were, were looking at global health and public policy. Um, I have learned quite a bit from this, uh, mainly because as an engineer, you feel like you can build anything. Um, but if the people will not use it, you've built a big, expensive paperweight. So uh, one of our colleagues on the team, uh, or the co-PI on, on, on the, uh, the program itself, is a social scientist. And he's built a career around technology adoption and, and, and underdeveloped worlds. And, and it's been eye-opening and enlightening. And what you see here is, is some of the metrics that he's done. You know, he's carried out household surveys where they actually uh, worked with an NGO partner uh, within uh, the communities there, and they went out and they talked. Uh, they engaged with them. They showed them pictures. They showed them videos. They said, hey, this is what we want to bring to your community. What, what will happen? You know, will, you, will, will you engage in it with us, and will you help us figure out uh, these solutions? So again, these low-income households were, were selected randomly, uh, and, and the goal was to understand sanitation practices and preferences and how the users evaluate the features of this specific system that we were looking at. Uh, again, they did some focus group discussions where they brought in uh, a whole bunch of folks at the prototype site itself, um, not only in uh, Baroda, but also in Ahmedabad. And, and what this allowed the folks to do was actually to come in contact with the processing unit itself. So they were actually seeing solid liquid separator. They were seeing how we were drying. They were seeing how we were combusting. But they were also seeing how we were treating the effluent. And then again, we took that user feedback at the prototype. So as people were, were utilizing the system, as they were going into the system, as they came out, we offered them the opportunity to give us candid uh, remarks at exactly what they thought. So, some of the key takeaways, especially on water reuse. Um, that was the big, big driving force behind what we wanted to do was that um, the water access at the toilet is a driver for the use. It needs to have water access. Uh, the water conservation is valued, especially in water stress communities. Uh, the water reuse is very viable, but it's not a showstopper, which, was, which is interesting to us, but these were environments that weren't really water starved itself. Um, Water reuse is a value addition for future products moving forward, but also there were social cultural factors that varied and influenced the reuse scenarios. For instance, 
the, the, the Muslim community compared to the Hindi community in Ahmedabad. Uh, the Muslim community, and, and I, should, I should classify the, the, the paper world and the non-paper world. Um, so these are washers as opposed to wipers. Um, from there, if they got any affluent or treated liquid on their hands and they knew it came from somebody's other's, other's body, they would go to temple. Um, so that was unacceptable for them to use it for hand wash, but they were okay with body wash and flush reuse. So you get to a point where you have to be cognizant exactly what the community needs uh, and then design to that community wants. So to carry on some lessons for our further technology development is, is, is appearance, color, odor has been the sole focus of how we're gonna do things. Um, the presence of the chlorine smell uh, in, in, the, in the flush water is viewed as positive because when people smell that, they think of sterilization. And then steps for further polishing, uh, which is what, you, which I showed earlier, is a hybrid approach to, to improve the clarity and improve the, uh, the metrics of that reuse water. So that helped us understand um, what we were doing, you know, how can we, how can we make the technology better uh, and we couldn't have done it without a whole bunch of partners. Um, and this is just a list of the primary partners that we've used on this specific project, but there's a multitude others. And, and we engage with a lot of partners uh, like Sewa um, in um, the Self-Employed Women's Association in India. I think they're the largest one in the world in India and Pakistan. They've been absolutely wonderful uh, for us to understand the community engagement. Uh, but, then, but then again, you have to, you know, you put a team together, but you want to make sure that team can solve the problem. Um, we knew that we didn't have all the answers. Uh, we knew that we had to go out and find people to help us find the answers. And this is just a small segment of, of who we've engaged for this program. So that carries on to the next discussion, which is great because about three years ago, uh, we got engaged with the Department of Defense and the U.S. military. And this is a short video uh, that shows what we're doing with them right now. the toilet with on-site waste remediation for DOD applications. And what was alarming to us is that 60% of all injuries in the last two conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan has been support staff. This support staff has been trucking in water, trucking out waste, trucking in fuel. All these parameters or all these commodities that were being brought in were to sustain a Ford operating base. <laughs> What we're looking at is generating a decentralized waste processing system. So we're actually taking the waste from a flush, we're separating the liquid from the solid, we're treating the liquid to disinfection or sterilization, and then we're drying the solid and then combusting it. We have a dryer and combustor system. The combustor burns the dried feces to provide the heat for the dryer. So it's, a, it's kind of a closed loop there. And then hopefully using that thermal energy that we use as a, as a combustion and then translating that into energy. Yeah, we see a lot of uh, other sort of platforms to utilize this approach to having a mobile technology uh, that treats human waste on site. So one certainly is for emergency response, uh, disaster settings after a tornado or a flood or a hurricane, um, having a, something that could come in where people are, uh, where they may have lost what they had, uh, or they're being resettled into a new site that has no types of infrastructure. This could be uh, one platform to service that need. 
Another big problem in our world today is refugees. Uh, we've got big camps, um, thousands of thousands of people um, that are brought together and turned into small cities. They don't have either the time or the resources really to construct uh, pipe sewage treatment plants. This project is important to me and as well as RTI to improve the human condition. We work towards solving sanitation issues around the world and it makes me feel good to do my job. This program all started with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and we looked at taking transformative technologies to the, the underdeveloped world to look at their sanitation and waste problems. At that time, about three or four years ago, we partnered up with Natick the Soldier Welfare Division there, uh, working with their research scientists and looking at taking those technologies and translating them over to DOD applications. The way we have treated it in the past uh, is not very smart. It's a big uh, use of energy. It's a horrible waste of water. And is, it's a neglected issue. Uh, almost 2.4 billion people around the world lack access to safe uh, sanitation services. Um, what's nice about the DOD program that we have with Natick is that it's hopefully going to solve a problem for them. Now, if we can reduce the amount of time, energy, and personnel that it takes to sustain these Ford operating bases, we'll not only save lives, but we'll also save funding for those bases. So that's been an important partner of ours as well as with the foundation. So not only does that show you applications in the underdeveloped world, but it also shows you applications in the developed world. Um, these are just some photos of what the system looks like. Um, it's a mobile platform. Um, it's the, almost the exact same technology uh, with some different material selections for, for uh, corrosion purposes. But what the military has done uh, more recently is they're looking at decentralized uh, as opposed to centralized, where the truck, they would truck it out and then process it somewhere else. Um, what they want to be able to do is bring in a solution that can be quickly adapted uh, and, and, and remediate any waste from that base camp itself. Um, this is what I call lever leveraging funding. Um, it's nice because you can develop a program. Another program can come on, uh, develop technologies very similar, but also help you take that technology and make it more aggressive and, 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 and further it down the line a lot quicker. So this has been a really good partnership with them. And as you heard my colleagues speaking there, there's a lot more applications out there that we feel that this is viable for. Um, some of the recent uh, natural disasters in the US, down in Houston, and then even in, in Puerto Rico, uh, boy, they could have used something like this um, uh, very quickly. And this is something that can be deployed along with some water treatment facilities. So, to finish up, there's a lot of opportunities here to collaborate that, that we envision is, is, you know, what is the impact of decentralizing a waste treatment on the energy water nexus in, in, in developing countries? Well, first thing we got to understand is, is this going to affect climate change? Um, we don't know because this is all novel. Um, you know, what is the impact of the off-the-grid sanitation solutions on the local power grid in terms of if we need to pull a lot of energy out of that grid, what does that actually do to that community? And then again, what's the impact on combustion-based uh, fecal waste processing on the atmospheric quality? You know, what are we putting out in the air? Are we doing something harmful um, to, the, to the atmosphere? Well, what's interesting is uh, so what is this impact, you know, especially on the atmospheric quality? So if we look at the average person per day produces about 125 grams of feces. So from there, we can look at what the human race does in terms of the 7.5 billion. So we're looking at 900 million kilograms per day of poop. Uh, that's 324 billion kilograms per year of poop. That's a lot of poop. So feces, by, by law here, by, by by science is 75% water. So that means there's a hundred billion kilograms of a biomass a year. So what can we do with that? Um, I mean, that, that's, that could be a valuable resource. So, but what happens when we burn it? You know, what does that do? Well, what's interesting is that if you look, compare it to other global emissions here, uh, automobiles generate uh, 1,500 metric tons. Um, the total worldwide annual emissions is about 10 metric tons, but burning 100 billion kilograms or 100 metric tons is about 1% of the global emissions. So is that significant? 
and what are the broader impacts of what we're trying to do here. Um, it's an interesting perspective to take a look at. It. So I want to finish up. I've been talking for quite some time. I appreciate your attention. But I, I, I said this in the classes today, and somebody asked me if I had any insight to the students. Well, I've had the ability to travel. Um, I, I can't stress enough to travel. The world is a big place, but it's not that big. Um, it's amazing the people that I meet when I do travel. Um, and when you go to these places, put yourself in a place that makes you feel uncomfortable. And what I mean is about five years ago, I went to a slum in India, and I was embarrassed to say that I was actually unnerved and very uncomfortable. Um, I didn't want these people to touch me. I didn't want to interact with them. It was, it was a very embarrassing when I left that. Um, but from that experience of feeling uncomfortable, um, you can find a passion. Um, we've been fortunate to have a funding agency that believes in us and relies on us. We've found a lot of partners that work with us. Um, and, and I think we've all, within our group, found our passion. Um, we really love what we're doing. Uh, we love engaging in the communities, um, and we love trying to solve a problem that, that I think you, as the next generation, go out there. It's only going to get bigger, and as you solve sanitation, then you're going to have a water problem, or you're going to have a hygiene problem, or you're going to have a food and ag problem. So, you know, I put the onus on you to help identify what that next problem is, and just try to figure out a way how you can implement some change on that. So that's my, that's on my cloud talking. But this is a thank you to our team members. I want to thank Elon. I want to thank my dear friend Scott Walter for, for having me invited here. Thank you for coming. I know I'm competing with NFL football, um, but I really appreciate your attention, and I'll take any questions that you have right now. Thank you. <laughs>